Hi, everybody. Welcome to episode 154 of the Effort Report. I'm Elizabeth Matsui. I'm here with Roger Pang. And today we're discussing. <laughs> what are we discussing? We have a we have a lot of our segments are chock full. Or yeah, we're discussing everything. Everything. I was trying to do like the newscaster thing where like you say something and then like I say something and then, you know, we go back and forth, but it didn't work. It didn't work. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a bad sign for this episode. <laughs> so we had like a solid 30 seconds of like organization and now it's all going to fall apart. It's all fall- falling apart. Should we get started here? Yeah. So work in progress. I, I, I don't know why I put this under work in progress, but I guess I did because we keep talking about this, which is you know, how conferences that we're going to are constantly having to navigate the changing context of the pandemic. And my big national meeting is the end of February. Word on the street is, so it's designed and was designed as a hybrid from the get-go. And I think, I don't, I had no insight into how that decision was made. So I'm just speculating that it was probably somewhat of a compromise so that if there were people who felt uncomfortable going, that there'd be some virtual content and then they would try to have some in-person content. And so word on the street, and again, this is all rumor, is that they're they're forging ahead with the hybrid. They are not switching to all virtual. And I have multiple sort of in-person things that I committed to. Okay. It's strange because like this meeting got canceled. This meeting typically is at the end of February or beginning of March. And in 2020, you know, I think the meeting was a little bit later than usual. And maybe the first day was something like March 13th. And so there was total chaos because it got just completely canceled. Right. Like, you know, days before it was supposed to start. And then last year it was all virtual. And so this is the first year where there's an in-person component. And I think it's, it's already sort of stressful enough because I'm like exhausted about the concept of in-person actually. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I'm looking at my schedule. I'm like, how did I do this before? They're like committee meetings and a breakfast, this and an editorial board that and a moderating here and um, a little bit of like everything all the time. So that I was already sort of like, I don't know how I'm going to like re like re-enter this world. And I think it probably speaks to my introversion. And then the second thing is part of me was like, okay, there's this big Omicron surge. So maybe it'll just move to virtual and then I can just sort of delay working on my talks. <laughs> That's like a game of chicken you're playing. It, it is. Well, you'll be happy to know that I, I put an outline and content together, general content for one talk yesterday. So I'm not falling into that trap because I am a closer in the end. <laughs> but Wait, can I ask us a, a brief side question there? Y- yes. The, is a closer and preparer the same thing? <laughs> like, do, do closers prepare well or do they just close re- regardless of the, you know? I think that being a closer is conditional on being a preparer. Yeah. Okay. I don't know. Do you, no, do you disagree? Just, I, I think you're probably right because I think preparing you know leads to closing yeah yeah i mean maybe there there's like a path to closing that doesn't go through preparing but (laughs) that seems that's a that's not a a highly in the two by two table of closing and preparing that's like a very uh, it's a sparse cell right rare phenomenon so then i was imagining what this thing was going to be like because as we were just chatting before this like i I wear like a pretty, during the times of Omicron, I wear a pretty high grade mask. So if I'm in a public space indoors, I wear um, basically the equivalent of an N95. So I'm just kind of imagining like if I get up on the podium or am I giving a talk in my N95? I, I just haven't even like wrapped my brain around this. And like, there's like a breakfast gathering with trainees. Uh huh. Like, what is that going to look What's, like? And yeah, that's 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 a different story. Yeah. <laughs> and are there actually going to be people there? Because now I've started to hear that, you know, you have to get permission from your institution to travel in most cases, I think. And some people are unable to get that permission. Yeah. So 
is it going to be kind of a dud because the only people who are going to be there are the people who committed to do something in person. And even not all those people are going to be able to be there because their institutions are not approving travel. So I was just sort of imagining this sort of weird post-apocalyptic in-person meeting scenario. I think the in-person component has the potential to be like one of the saddest events of your entire life. That's what, yes, that you said it much more succinctly than I did, but that's my sort of concern. And like a lot of activities are like, you know, grabbing lunch between sessions or right, yeah. dinner or hanging out at the hotel bar or like, is it at a conference center? It is. It's in Phoenix. Yeah. Like that. <laughs> I mean, walking around like, like a half empty conference center, that's gotta be. Whew. Right. And then seeing people like you haven't seen in three years, essentially. It, it, like, like that's that's also you know just like layers on top of like the whole so I think it's going to feel very surreal and I'm not looking forward to that feeling <laughs> yeah 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 I just just me like going to the office last semester you know it was kind of like it's kind of like that like a mini version of that right like people you hadn't seen in two years and uh and it, all the every everything's empty and like nobody's around and it's just like ghost town and I don't know it's just Right. Yeah, I don't recommend it. Well, I think I've I've made my commitment. Although I actually haven't formally asked permission to go yet. I need to do that this coming week to get uh, approval from from my institution. Ooh, we'll have interesting follow up in future episodes. That's right. Yeah. Maybe they'll lay lay down the law, and I won't be. I, they'll deny my request. Yeah, I'm, I'm feeling kind of icky about it, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think we might have to just like reschedule all conferences that occur in the winter <laughs> right mean, like for good like forever right right no more conferences of winter right i guess on the plus side it should be you know weather should be reasonable enough in phoenix that you could do outdoor dining yeah that's true yeah but it's still and then i think the other added layer is i'm sort of in the camp of like why would i not wear an N95 and like, why would I not do a simple thing to avoid getting COVID? Like I've know people who've gotten it. It's not pleasant. And so I think there'll be, and I've, we've navigated with our friends here, kind of the whole awkward etiquette of like, if you're having people over, do you, you know, do you ask about boosting status or do rapid testing or, you know, and then I think there's the re sort of navigation of all of that with this other set of collaborator friends or whatever there, right? Like some people are going to be totally comfortable bellying up to the bar and right. Yeah. Throwing their, their placebo cloth mask to the side. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so there's that. And then the last thing there is, is like this idea of like, well, what if you get there and while you're there, you get it. And then you're like stuck, right? Because you, you know, you're not going to travel with it. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. And so anyway, I'm packing some, some of my uh, rapid antigen tests. Sounds like a road trip is, is in store. You know what? Now that you, I wonder how long of a drive it is. I think it's a fairly long drive. I'm looking it up right now. Yeah, you are from <laughs> Austin to Phoenix. Austin to Phoenix. Uh-huh. All right, here we go. Calculations are 13 hours and 14 13 hours. hours. 14, 14 hours. 14 hours. Yes. So uh, probably not also quite a desert drive. <laughs> yes. Well, actually, uh, well, uh, yeah, it's uh, we drove. Well, I think so. You know, when I went hiking and broke my wrist in Big Bend National Park in November, we drove through West Texas. So if you go the southern route, it was actually quite pretty. Oh, okay. And the northern route is a lot like sort of flatter with like lots of oil rigs and <laughs> right. there were more there were more more wind windmills on the southern route. But anyway, that's a long drive. Yes. By yourself. Right. And then if you have COVID. Also not making it better, yeah. Yeah. Like it's just anyway. There's a lot to think about. There's a lot to think about. And you can tell, like it's a it's a it's a month away and 
it's already causing me angst. <laughs> uh well a lot can change in a month who knows that's true well the the good news is i think we'll be in terms of case counts we'll be in a much better place so and then i i understand that although this is it won't be ready then is i think that there's like an omicron specific booster that's supposed to be like ready for fda consideration in march oh okay is the projected timeline but you know by then we'll be on to pi that's right yeah Pi is a good number. I mean, in general, not a good variant, probably. But no, as people have been joking on Twitter, because it goes on forever. You know, I just uh, it just occurred to me as we were as you were talking about this that I agreed to an in person meeting in May. Maybe one thing that we should discuss, well, maybe for a future episode, is like <laughs> coming up with excuses for not going. <laughs> yes. I agreed to one in the beginning of April and that one got just completely canceled. Oh, really? But I agreed to an international one in June. Ah. Yeah. Man, I haven't been to an international meeting, like a work-related international meeting. I can't even, like, I don't even know how long it's been. It's been years, multiple years. Well, I have an opportunity for you that just came up to be a speaker at a meeting (laughs) in in the environmental health space in June. Do you want it? (laughs) (laughs) I can. I can email the organizers now. Yeah, I don't know. You think, well, June seems like so far away. Yeah. March seems so far away. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> At this point. Um, all right. Well, keep us posted. Yeah, well, you, I will. You'll you'll continue to hear, like, people will be tortured because the next episode we record will be before the meeting and there'll have to be, like, a segment where I work through my angst about it again. <laughs> Moving on. Yes. Um, so I, as you know, as the director of content relations of this podcast. Oh, look, I got a new title. No, I'm the I'm the director. Of oh, 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 you're the content. Wait, I don't even know what that means. I just made that up. But you just but, uh, gave yourself a title. Yeah. So okay. um, one, of the, one of my jobs is to research other podcasts and to steal all the best ideas from those podcasts to bring to our podcast, right? Oh, that seems like something that goes under your leadership academy. Well, I think it's more like market research. You know, I'm 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 making I'm keeping tabs on what's happening in, in the world of podcasting, right? And uh, one of the things I do, I think I talked about this before. I listen one of my favorite podcasts is the Script Notes podcast. They talked about something that I thought was super relevant to our podcast. This is a um, a writer. Actually, she won the Nobel Prize. Her name is she's Polish, and her name is. Uh, uh, I'm gonna pronounce it incorrectly, but um, this lava. Wait, what is it? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna find it here. Hang on a second. Have to have a Google. Wisława Zimborska. Uh huh. And uh, she, so she died in 2012. Won the Nobel Prize. It's in the 90s, I think. And um, <clears throat> and she apparently had a column in Polish uh, where people could write in about like being a writer, and she would respond. And it sounds like the responses were always like quite like critical. <laughs> oh. I guess. And um and so one of the things that uh so there's like a book now that's like a translation of all these columns that she wrote. And I guess the one of the quotes, I guess I just wanted to read it from here. So it says uh the exp- so yeah, the idea is that you know writers would write in for advice, basically, right? And so it says here, the aspiring writers imagine that being an author will bring them happiness, fame, and fortune. Samborska tells them to get a grip. Writing is a ridiculous profession. Failure is inevitable. Success is highly conditional and mostly feels like failure as well. Wow, that um, that quite resonates. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think that applies to academia. Uh, I think it applies to everything, frankly. But, Probably, uh, yes. Yeah, but I think I mean I think it maybe particularly to ag- academia, since I think there is just a lot in common with writing in general. I, I, I think this this idea that success is highly conditional and uh, mostly feels like failure as well, uh, I thought it's worth the analyzing just for a minute. So, because I think the idea that, that success feels like failure is feels it seems very foreign until it actually ha- until it happens to you, right? And then you realize, oh, that's kind of happens all the time. Uh, but I think so. Like the success is highly conditional. That one I think is a little easier to understand because it's it's basically I think you know when I there's like another saying that to me that that kind of reflects this which is that like you, know, you can uh, you can never rob a bank the same way twice you know 
the idea that like the conditions under which you succeed are like so idiosyncratic as to be essential almost kind of random and there's often like sometimes there's lessons to be learned but often there's not right 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 and um and then the success and then success feeling like failure as well well can we can, can we go back to the highly conditional because yes. because yeah. i think i want to like think about it in in terms of kind of academia and i guess but uh, like to make it more concrete and okay. i guess the way <laughs> <laughs> we have to we have to go from your like you know your approach of like generalizing everything to an equation with greek letters in it to like <laughs> specific examples <laughs> yes exactly well and i guess what i think of and it's is if you just even think of one example, which is think of all, you know, the grants that you've written, which ones get funded and the direction in which you go is is highly conditional on a whole variety of factors, some of which are completely unobserved, but some are, you know, things like the composition of the study section, what kind of RFA is put out by whatever, you know, institute. Um what happens to be kind of the hot topic and at the time um, and is it aligned kind of with what you do and a whole variety of other factors and I think there there are times where you it, it, you can grapple with and, and maybe we've talked about this before but this idea that when you know you get the grant that you wanted to get funded like you can't ever get funded but the one that you're sort of like, yeah, you know, this should be done, but I'm not that wild about it gets funded. And those sort of forces inform, you know, the terms of, of your success. I remember one time in the, in my department, we were talking about like posting grants onto like a Google Drive folder or something uh, so that people could look at what grants, you know, if, you, if you're writing a grant, you could look at it. Um, and, uh, and I proposed... Uh, we should have two folders, one for like ones that were funded and ones that for ones that were not funded. Uh -huh. And then someone suggested to me, like, how would you be able to like, how could you tell the difference? <laughs> right, <laughs> like, right. There is no difference. I mean, if you look, if you, if you look, so we did, I think when we did do it, you looked at the two folders, there was no difference. I mean, you couldn't really tell. Um, right. So at least not from the, from the text of the grant itself. Right. Um, but the, the, this idea that su that success feels like failure as well. <laughs> I, I wonder if you, I have some personal thoughts on that. And I think this can manifest in a couple of different ways. Uh, the first is that I think often there's such a, a long road to success that by the time that you get there, you're like, you barely care. Right. Right. Oh, yes. That's, that, that's for sure. Like I literally just did that. I published a paper, like it just got accepted uh, after me trying to get this thing published for, I think, three years now. I think this is, I'm in the third year right now. Um, and it's like, what am I going to throw a party? Like, <laughs> like I, I could, I could, I can't even look at this paper one more time. Right. Well, it becomes sort of like a relief because you've gotten a monkey off your back more than something to celebrate. I think I've even passed that point. Like, oh, I've passed it's the not point even of, a relief. It's not even a relief. Right? <laughs> so, so there's the kind of like the long path, right? Um, and then I think the other one is sometimes, like you said, like sometimes you succeed, you, it's easier to succeed at things that you don't really, that you don't care as much about. Right. Um, and then that's always a bit of a conundrum, I think, to say it politely. <laughs> um, well, I think the last thing is like, even when you do, when all the conditions are meant, are met, it's like, then it's over, right? And then, like the next day, you're just back to yourself again, <laughs> right? It's just you and whatever, right? Um, and then, so anyway, I, that, that, that's not like a feeling of failure, but it, it's like it is a feeling of just like, you know, I don't know what the resignation yeah. on to the next thing. Yeah, exactly. There's another one, which is that it, it's the expectation of the ratio. Uh, of like how many attempts should yield, you know, a out of X number of attempts, how many of them should be successful in whatever it is that you're doing, right? And I think there is, it can feel like failure because 
if your expectation is that, you know, eight times out of 10 that you submit a grant or a paper, you know, it's funded or accepted, then it's going to feel like you're failing all the time. And that expectation in part is determined by like your own kind of baseline view of yourself, right? So it's expectations you kind of have of yourself, but it's also like how much experience and insight do you have in terms of what like the reality is on the ground in terms of, you know, the percent of times people are successful when they submit a paper as as one example. So there's expectation setting where you're sort of having to reset expectations within yourself because maybe you have high expectations to start out with. And then there's expectation setting based on sort of benchmarking on what's kind of the, the, the norm or not the norm, but like what is the average and distribution and the kind of work that we do. And that can be, so you can feel like failure there because you have not kind of set your expectations to be aligned with reality. Does that, does that make any sense? Well, I, I, but I, if I understand what you're saying, you're saying that like when you fail, it'll feel like failures. <laughs> it'll feel like failure, right? Uh, I'm saying an aggregate, right? Like if you, if you look back, here's an example. So Bill had to submit his K like twice as many times as I had to submit mine. Right. But he, but he got it and he's like hugely successful in what he does, but that felt like, you know, a failure to him because he expected that he would have to submit it twice and it would get funded. Oh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Right. Like you have these expectations for, and you set your expectations just based on sort of your own orientation about, you know, what you think is excellence or success, um, but you, that your expectations and how you set them are also informed by your knowledge and insight into kind of what's typical or the norm, you know, in academia, in this field. And so if you don't calibrate those Um, it can feel like you're failing left and right when actually, you know, you've been hugely successful. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I guess the the first time I just sort of yammered on incoherently, apparently. (laughs) Well, (laughs) part of me wonders whether it matters what your expectations are. Um, Because I feel like if you expect failure and, you know, reality plays out as it does, and then eventually you succeed, I think it's, it's kind of like, I don't know if it necessarily feels good <laughs> after having like a string of nine failures, you know, even if you expected them, right? Uh, but I think it's all relative to if you didn't expect them. Well, I think if you didn't expect them, then you still feels it doesn't still doesn't feel great. I mean, I, my point is that like whether, regardless of where your expectations are, when you finally when you succeed, I don't think it necessarily feels great. <laughs> oh, I get, and you're you're thinking about. Um... You're dichotomizing feeling great or not. Yeah. Yeah. So it's sort of a continuum, right? I guess the lesson here is that in general, in a field like this, and probably in writing or other arts, you know, like failure is the norm. Like you're not going to hit it out of the park every single time or even most of the time, right? Right, right. And so because of that, you know, it just becomes this thing that like, I don't know. It just, it, that's ingrained in you, you know? Right. And you, figuring out how to kind of uh, navigate that and, and live with that without. Um... And, the, and the, the truly and the successful moments are like, are there kind of like, like blips in the noise? You know what I mean? They're fleeting. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I just, I didn't mean to. Go... <laughs> that was quite uplifting. Thank you. I feel so much better now. I think it's the, <laughs> it's part of the path to feeling better though. Wait. What's part of the path of feeling realizing better. this? Like, I think oh. if you're like, if you don't realize this, then you will never be happy. <laughs> There's no chance. Right. So that's back to expectation setting. Ah, okay. Right. So if, if, if you realize this, which concretely is that, you know, 80% of stuff that you throw out there is going to be rejected, or I'm making that number up, then that can be helpful. Yeah. All right. Pet peeves? 
Uh, this is, uh, I believe, this is your segment. Yes. So this is this is more aimed at kind of experienced people, but there is this kind of um, issue that comes up sometimes where, well, you and I have even in your world this happens, but there's all this bureaucracy or reg- and regulation and where you have to like create these documents that say kind of what you're going to do, you know, for example, kind of not extreme example, but kind of obvious example is like, if you have materials that you have sent in as a part of your IRB application that are approved and you say that, um, I don't know, you're going to collect a blood sample on day two of something, then that actually means that you have to collect the blood sample on day two, right? It's not just this sort of like, well, I'm just going to write this document up because I have to check a box and then I'll go and divorced from that document, I will just go and do what makes sense. So the pet peeve is when it's not recognized that the document and the actual action are not divorced from one another, (laughs) like what's written in the document. Like you have to figure out actually how to do that. If you've written that you're going to do that because you're telling some sort of either funder or regulatory authority or something else that you're going to do it this way. And there's a typically a reason why you have to submit a document that says you're going to do something that way. And that's because people can come back and like audit you or ask to see the minutes of, you know, the committee meeting or what have you. And I've encountered this a lot and it's puzzling to me how that happens. I'm, I'm not even sure the psychology behind that, but that, that the actions and the things that you do get divorced from some document that you have to fill out, right? It's sort of like filling out, I don't know, your tax forms in a certain way, but then you deciding how much money makes sense to right, you just pay, pay some for other amount. Right, yes. yeah. It's this, and I've, I've like observed this like over and like, for decades, right? Like it's not just sort of this one-off thing and I'm utterly confused by it. And I, I have, you know, I I don't know what to do about it, but it's like a fascinating phenomenon and um, continues to be surprising when it happens. Less so for someone earlier in their career, maybe, but certainly for someone who's been around the block, it's, it's uh, a bit surprising. Is this ringing? I mean, I know you don't deal with IRB applications, but there may be other things you deal with, like, you know, agreements about how data is going to be stored and who's going to access it and all those sorts of details related to data integrity and security. Well, I think like many things in life, actually taxes is a a good example. Um, Like there are just so many things where there is a protocol for doing things, but no one's checking on that protocol, you know, like, or at least not for a while. Right. Um, and I think it's people, there's a feeling that I think many people get that's like, well, you know, this is all just on the honor. This is like on the honor system, like just like taxes. Right. I mean, I think, and so we can just wing it until later, you know, essentially. And I think, um, I could see how someone could fall, you know, so many things that we do in research are just like, you know, the process is important, but there's no one who's like, most of the time, there's no one who's breathing down your neck, like checking on that process. Right, right, right. right. And so it's easy to, not good, but it's easy to um, just kind of be like, well, we don't have to, we can do, we can ignore that, you know? Right, right. But then there's a bit of sort of creep in that. For sure. Right, right. Where Absolutely, yeah. Um, the ignoring decision is made out of, it's not like what you described as sort of this very deliberate, like, okay, the risk associated with this is trivial and blah, blah, blah. So, so the person is saying, I understand that this document is related to what I'm going to do. And I need to think about that. And, but there's this other form of that. That's like a step further away where there's not even the thought that the document 
is linked in a meaningful way. It's sort of like, well, this document just has to exist someplace. Right. Yeah, like we're going to write this because we have to check a box. Right, in order for me to go and do what I think is best. Right. And that's a fascinating phenomenon. But but I, so I think it's like taking what you just described, but it then somehow gets, um, there's an extension to that thinking that, um, gets kind of promulgated somehow and, um, absorbed by people. So right, that was like, not a super exciting pet peeve. <laughs> wait, wait, we might have to go through the list of pet peeves to figure out which one's the most exciting. <laughs> the most exciting. Oh, you're making, none of them are exciting. Well, we could, you know, we could can the segment. No, no. I think it's an essential part of the podcast. Yeah. All right. As is this next seg- segment. Yes. yes. Lessons from golf and space. So my um, distal radial fracture, so my broken wrist, I'm now 10 and a half weeks out. And um, first of all, oh my God, it, it's, it's not normal. And I was told by the orthopedic surgeon that it would take a year, you know, for it to like fully heal and it may not, it's not going to have total range of motion even by then. But so that's been a shocker to me. I didn't, I either forgot my orthopedic rotation about, you know, I forgot about it or like, I have no clue. Like it was a long time ago. Yeah, it was a long time ago. So, um, and I was told that I could do like a full on golf swing starting three months out. Okay. So that's like in February. Um, and so I've started doing mini swings in the garage and I think I'm going to have to go back for more lessons. Uh, you've forgotten it. Well, so I think you can get rusty, right? And I think you can, you can get rusty even while you're playing. I mean, this is a pretty normal, but not like normal, like, I guess, socioculturally in golf where, um, you can every now and then just go take a lesson. Uh, okay. Like even if you haven't had this three month hiatus or whatever, like I'll have. Right. Um, and so people will go do that. And I kind of thought that it was as a beginner it, to me, it's a little bit odd because like I wanted lessons like every single week. Um, and I think I probably still kind of want that, but it's interesting because what it tells you is like, you're, constantly trying to improve your game and make adjustments and that there's a value in having someone external to you sort of, you know, observe you and coach you rather than you trying to figure out, you know, okay, this is what I'm doing wrong because you often can't really, you know, it's, you can sort of start to understand maybe what you're doing wrong, but it's, it's not nearly, as insightful as like someone else watching it. And I think the same thing is true kind of in what we do. And to me, it was similar to, you know, I had a grant that a collab, a friend read and just the Ames page. And so she gave some feedback and it was sort of this aha, like, oh, this is like grant writing 101. Like, why didn't I think of that? (laughs) This was like, you know, within the last 12 months or so. And I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, so I just think it highlights the value of ongoing continued feedback from like an independent party. Like you can't do it all yourself. And sometimes you have to go back to basics um, and others are, can be very helpful in giving you feedback and, and, and coaching in that regard. So um, I'm endorsing sort of the golf model of, <laughs> <laughs> take a lesson every now and then. All right. That's a good lesson. I don't know how you, you know, formalize that except for seek out feedback from others, regardless of how far along you are in your career. Right. Yeah. Uh, lessons from space. Yeah. I actually have a lesson here that is going to, it's going to cross, it's going to be cross cutting. Wow. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about, I call it the hierarchy of realizing there's a problem. And um, I was, I, I was um, thinking, so this goes to the Apollo 13 mission, which 
I think most people, if they've heard of it, know that there was like an accident on board and they had to, you know, work day and night to like make sure that everyone got that the astronauts got home safely. Tom Hanks. There you go. There was a whole movie about it. Yeah. Which I highly recommend. The movie is shockingly accurate. Um, <laughs> it's really quite good, actually. It, and so, but, and Tom Hanks, you know, he's, he's usually great. So, um, uh, anyway, one of the things that isn't in the movie, but is in a lot of like the books that have been written by the astronauts who are actually there, um, is this idea that like, you know, when you have like a kind of like a hierarchy of, of command or like authority, uh, like they, you know, NASA back in the sixties, you know, everyone, all the astronauts were, were military. A lot of the people came from the military. Um, and so they, uh, they had kind of like this hierarchical structure and then there was, it felt natural to them, I think. But there was a feeling that like the, it's a sense of like people. So Jim Lovell, who was the captain, the commander of that mission talked about how like the people who are kind of like closest to the action, they know immediately when there's a problem. All right. And then like, there's this, this, the, the, uh, the kind of like sense of there's a problem kind of dilutes as you go higher and higher and up the hierarchy. So like, there's like, you know, so in that particular event, you know, the astronauts on the spacecraft, they know there's a problem. They're not, they know they're not landing on the moon. They, they know they'll be lucky if they even survive. Right. And then there's like mission control, which is like, well, maybe there's a problem, but maybe we can fix it, you know? And then there's like the kind of uh, uh, the political leadership that's like, oh, we're still going to be, you know, and then there's like the, at the very top, you know, would be like the president or something like that. But, um, and so like the way that this kind of feeling kind of dilutes as you go up the hierarchy, it kind of I, I thought about this as we look at everything that's kind of happening with COVID nineteen. You know, it's like there's a there's layers of people who kind of see what's happening and they know that this is like there's a problem like right now. Uh, and then as you kind of it seems like as you go up the la the kind of layer of leadership, there's kind of like a delayed process of realizing okay, well we need to make some change or we need to change the guidance or we need to change this or whatever. Um, and um, anyway, so that's a uh, th that's the phenomenon that I wanted to talk about. So you think that that is generalizable in terms of academia as well? <laughs> well, I think, I guess it's maybe worth discussing why this happens. My feeling is that, you know, if you're, if you're like, for example, in the spacecraft, right, <laughs> then you're getting direct inputs from the source of the problem. Right. Uh, and that's the only input that you're getting, right? Because that's it, right? You're there, right? Um and it, as each layer, if you go up one layer, let's say you're in mission control now, right? Now you're getting inputs from like many different, more things. Like you're not, like you're hearing from the astronauts are saying, hey, there's a problem here. They're saying, Houston, there's a problem, right? Right. <laughs> but there's Houston, inputs coming from like the flight controllers who are saying like, oh, that can't be a problem. This must be an instrumentation failure, you know? So now there's like inputs coming from a variety of people, right? And then if you go up one layer, now you've got inputs coming from even more people, right? And then, you know, this po political... It's a signal to noise issue. Right. So arguably the noise increases kind of as you go up the Right, hierarchy. right. And, yeah. and the other thing that increases is the higher up you are, you're in a more sort of public, I'm putting it in kind of air quotes, but position. And so there's more kind of embarrassment and shame attached to something not going right. Right. So there's yeah. some psychology that I think kind of is a barrier or can impact your ability to separate the signal from the noise. Right. Um, so I, I, I think it's worth thinking about that just because I think it's, you. I mean, I think it's common to assume that like leadership is only getting inputs from you. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, even if you know, that's not true. I think it's tempting to think that it is true or that your inputs are important and other people's are irrelevant. Right. Right. I, I think it's worthwhile to recognize kind of the phenomenon that's occurring and, and what it's in the source of what it's kind of how it originates, I guess. Not that there's necessarily anything you can do about it, I suppose. Right. So if you're in the, in the position of seeing the problem, is there any advice you would give to making your, making it clear that you're providing signal, not noise? Well, I guess in some cases, and mostly in the political context, you know, I think if you know what those other inputs are, so if you want to influence leadership in some way, right? And you know that they're getting an earful from some group over here that's not you, right? Um, it may be possible to work with that group, right? Um, in some way to kind of 
influence, you know, leadership together, I guess. Right. I think the other thing is, and this is, you can only do this by kind of going back in time or having the foresight, but whether you're likely, the leadership's judgment about whether you are just part of the noise or actually providing real signal kind of depends on your reputation and your relationship with the leadership too. So, um, and I, I've actually kind of heard this, oh yes, that person tends to whine a lot. And so if that becomes sort of the perception of that person, if the leadership has that perception of the person, then that means that it's going to be really hard for that person to sort of bring an issue up that is appropriately understood as like a real signal or a real problem. Right. But you can't, you can't fix that in the moment. Yeah. yeah. That, that's like a just understanding that of that dynamic may help you figure out how to kind of pick and choose and prioritize what issues that you bring up and how you bring them up. And certainly like uh, creating a coalition is, can be very helpful. Yeah. And I think if you look at an org chart for any organization, right, like the person at the top, let's say the president of the university or whatever, right. They have the maximum number of people, you know, giving them input essentially. Right. Right. And so to change something at that level, <laughs> you have to build a pretty large coalition, I think, or sizable one. Right. Yeah. That's it for that, I think. Okay. Leadership Academy. <laughs> Speaking of. Speaking of, once again, it's called Rogers Leadership Academy, but it's my, you know, lesson that I came up with. Well, because you're on the fast track to leadership. So, you know. I'm learning. You're learning a lot. Yeah. This is um, super helpful. Essentially, it is a mechanism for you to shut down anything that you like don't want to happen. So you invoke any rules, policies, or laws that maybe are not really applicable, or they're sort of adjacent to you know the initiative that someone wants to um, raise, or maybe they're non-existent. So you sort of I, like a great example is you invoke HIPAA. Oh, that's uh, a HIPAA violation, right? It's and, a catch-all. And, and really, if you understand HIPAA, like it's not a HIPAA violation, right? Like HIPAA allows you to um, disclose personal health information of a patient if you need to do that in order to care for the patient, right? And so sometimes you run into these scenarios where you know, some other doctor who's also caring for the patient who's, you know, another consultant or specialist is like, oh, did you get the HIPAA waiver signed? And that's absolutely not needed. Um, I'm just bringing that up because that's sort of this classic example, but there are a million different ways where people, you know, invoke things like HIPAA and because the, like leadership does and because the person proposing to do X doesn't, maybe not fully aware that actually, no, this is not a HIPAA violation or this is not a violation of X, Y, or Z ordinance law or regulation, they get completely shut down. Um, and it, it works, right? Because the leadership is coming from a place of authority, the uh, person being led, the leaded, the person being led <laughs> is already in a position where they don't want to sort of challenge authority. And then when the authority like, um, you know, implicates some like legal or regulatory issue, oh my God, you definitely don't want to try to like go up against that. Right. Right. Yeah. How dare you? And so it's like super effective. Yeah. Cause who, who wants to do paperwork? I mean, that's what it comes down to, right? Right, right. <laughs> like if I whip out HIPAA or even worse, maybe FISMA, you know, um, you probably don't know about FISMA. No, I was like, I have no idea. What... See, but I'd be like, oh, okay, FISMA. Like, I don't uh, know about that, but uh, it says we can't do it. Then sounds I guess like a lot of paperwork. So, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Well, and I think it's not even paperwork. Like it's it's the work that's required to do that thing. That's that includes paperwork, but it may include like, okay, well, let's actually see if there is a path forward to do this, right? Yeah. Which is very different than, nope, there's this FERPA. FERPA, there's another ah, one. Ah, FERPA, yeah, good one. Yes, yeah. yeah. 
There are lots of them. I would anyway. Say, yeah. Um, in the kind of defense of the dark arts kind of style, <laughs> I would say that if you're in this position that's you know, where someone's you're leading you in this matter, uh, one way to uh, diffuse it is to ask them, well, you know, what would that require? I would say like maybe seventy five percent of the time it's like, well, you've got to fill out some forms <laughs> or something like that, you know, or like if you do want to do it, then there's this one exception, and you have to do this one thing, and it's like, right. okay, well, why don't we just do that? You know, oh, well, I hadn't thought about that, yeah, yeah, so <laughs> give it, it's worth a shot sometimes it generally is a lot of work or it's generally not allowed, um, and then you know you're stuck, but often it is, yeah, so that that was like anti leadership right what I told you right well, now. that's. Yes. Well, it's anti anti leadership. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> because because Roger's leadership academy is actually satirical, right? Yes. And and I was like, I was like, I think you're no longer following the satire. I kind of here, I got but... lost in the vortex of yeah, satire. Yeah. Anyway, this 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 probably happens. I've had this pulled out at least once or twice a month. Wow. This this MO. Oh yeah. Left and right. <laughs> you must be proposing some crazy things. <laughs> Apparently I am. I'm yeah. like a radical. <laughs> All right. We have a solid 10 minutes left for our main topics. Okay. So we should pick one. Okay. What's it going to be? Let's talk about the co- COVID closet. Yes. I don't even know what that is. So I have to choose that because it's in the outline. I don't know what it is. You don't even know what it is. So... Basically, the COVID closet is all about managing or tolerating uncertainty. It exists in my household, but I'm really kind of using it as a metaphor. Okay. Basically, my MO for managing uncertainty is to like, like I'm not an infectious disease doc. I'm not an infectious disease epidemiologist. I don't understand all this modeling that people are doing and all that, but I probably know more about COVID than, you know, other people outside of the field, because not just because I'm like, this is how I'm going to control uncertainty, right? Like, I know I have rapid antigen tests, I give people know I have it, it's in my COVID closet, I have a whole suite of masks, I have my finger on the pulse of the Paxlovid and Molpirnavir, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, antiviral oral medications, like I know what pharmacies they, uh, that have them or whether those are out in the Austin area and actually have like helped immunocompromised, you know, friends or whatever kind of track stuff down. And like, I am like all over it. Um, and really it's my mechanism for managing, (laughs) attempting to manage and navigate uncertainty. And, um, and I think aside from just the, like, uncertainty that penetrates all aspects of our lives related to the pandemic and the uncertainty that it injects kind of professionally, as we talked about, like with this upcoming annual conference that I'm having angst over, there's just also a lot of inherent uncertainty in academia. And I think it goes back to your comment about how, you know, success can feel like failure. And I think that's like really the most, I would argue this is the most challenging part of academia is kind of the uncertainty, particularly when you're starting out earlier in your career. I've especially watched early career folks who have layered upon just the normal uncertainty of academia, sort of, you know, the COVID uncertainty and the the state of our our world right now. Um, And I don't, I don't have any good answers except for that the desi- there's an inherent desire, I think, to try, it can be an inherent desire, I have it, to try to eliminate uncertainty or reduce it. And sometimes you can, you can just prepare for it, but you don't have any direct ability to change sort of the context around you, right, which is, has, is what is fueling the uncertainty. And I've just had a lot of conversations lately where people are grappling with that uncertainty. And part of me sort of wishes that I had some insight into, well, you know, here's the way that we can reduce uncertainty related to, um, are you going to get tenure or 
uh, what's going to happen if you, you know, are you going to get this, you're going to run out of funding or, and I have no good answers except for that you can only control what you can control. So maybe get yourself a COVID closet. <laughs> so just to be clear, the COVID closet is an actual closet where you like put stuff. That's COVID yes, related. it actually, it literally exists. Okay. Because like when I first heard the phrase, I imagine, do you remember that? Like it was like a panic room. Do you remember that movie Panic Room? Um, it was like with Jodie Foster. Um, it was like oh, it was like twenty years ago now. But, oh, uh, um, yeah, maybe. It's yes. like a bu- it's like a bunker within your house. Right. That's like right, 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 <laughs> where right. You go when something there's a problem. Yes. Um, so it's not that. Just to be clear. No, maybe I need one of those now that you bring that up. You may have to put the COVID closet inside the panic room. Maybe. That, yeah. Yes. Yes. And the clo- COVID closet term. I mean, it literally. I, we have one. But there's an episode of Arrested Development recently where I think Larry David, like maybe went into someone's house and discovered, like he opened the door thinking it was a bathroom and there were like all these COVID supplies, right? So it was not like it was pejorative in that like, oh, this person's hoarding all these COVID supplies. They have a COVID closet. And I'm sort of fessing up that I have a COVID closet, although I open like I very much share my COVID supplies, um, but I am guilty of having a COVID closet. But it is my mechanism for managing uncertainty. Yeah, I, one thing I would say uh, in terms of managing uncertainty um, is uh, I do sometimes like to fall back on this uh, phrase. I think it goes to Eisenhower, which is that your plans are worthless, but planning is everything. And he was that was in reference to like you know, military type stuff, right? So when you go to war, I mean, anything can happen, right? But it doesn't mean you don't plan for it, right? Right. Um, and so I, I think one of the things that I have found useful, so another area where like things can be very uncertain is like, you know, in terms of like, you know, financial stuff, right? And I think it's useful to, is to, is to plan for things in a rational way. I think it, that's the, the irrational way is like the hard part. <laughs> I mean, it can be very difficult to do that. Um, but if you can imagine certain outcomes being unexpected or undesirable, right, you can think a little bit about, well, what would cause that to occur? And if there's something that, like, if there's some sequence of events that you have influence over that would cause that to occur, then you can try to plan for it a little bit. Um, and I think, I mean, the COVID closet is along those lines, right? There are a number of, there are many different outcomes that would be undesirable in this case, right? Um, and there are some things that you can do to kind of plan for them, right? And, uh, and likely something else will happen that you didn't think about, but at least the planning process, I think, I think the planning process nevertheless is helpful. Yes. And it, it actually, you know, it, to be honest, it's actually been very helpful. At least like we've had some friends who've gotten COVID and they needed antigen tests and they couldn't find them. And so people know um, they can come by. I leave them out on the bench outside of our front door and they pick them up. So I'm getting positive reinforcement for the COVID closet, I guess is what I'm saying. Right. Yeah. <laughs> do you have a, do you, do you have a COVID, do you, do you have a literal COVID closet or no? And if not, do you, what do you, do you, are you a planner? I, the funny thing is I think I don't have a COVID closet and I think that's how I deal with the uncertainty <laughs> it's by not thinking about it. <laughs> Ah, so yeah, I think that's the other thing is like out of sight, out of mind. Right, exactly. Yeah, which, uh, you know, I, seems to work every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that said, I think in general, I am a planner type of person. Um, and so it's easy for that to get out of hand, like you can get paralyzed by it, I think. So obviously, like all things in life, like you have to do it in moderation. Oh, right. Oh, I'm yeah. For sure. And I think I sometimes um, get sucked into the, the the vortex a bit, the COVID vortex, and it, that's not, not a good place to be. I think, you know, like when I teach data analysis, sometimes I try to get this, I think I've talked about this, but I try to get the students to think about in advance, like, you know, what would be unexpected and what would be expected. And then, and they sometimes they'll talk, say, so, well, this would be unexpected or this would be, you know, it's like, oh, and then like, what would you, what would cause that to occur? Is there some way to like check that before we do it? And it's like, I think often they don't see that, like, you can actually think of things in advance before they occur, <laughs> right? And they may or may not occur, but thinking about them 
like it actually has some value and can influence what you do in the present. Yeah. COVID closet. There you go. There you go. So <laughs> that's, you know, your next sort of iteration of your advanced state analysis class <laughs> is COVID you're, closet. You're, you're, yeah, you're going to have a lecture that's titled The COVID Closet. It sounds like our advice is to either think about stuff a lot or don't think about them at all. <laughs> or ignore it. Yes. yes. Pick pick one or the other and just stay in that lane. But have people in your inner circle who, like if you're not a COVID closet person, be sure to have a COVID closet person in your inner circle. <laughs> right. And, yeah. and, then vi- and then vice versa. Like To be honest, I don't even think this advice is a joke. Like I think the worst case scenario is to kind of think about it, but not really do anything about it. You know, like I think uh-huh. that's the worst, right? Because then you're not actually helping yourself, but you're just worrying about it all the time. Right, right. right? Um, like not having a COVID closet, but then worrying about, but then worrying about it all the time is like the worst case scenario, right? Right, right. So either don't worry about it, <laughs> which I don't know if I would generally recommend, or <laughs> plan, plan for it. Plan. Because if you plan, then you're also going to be a closer. There you go. Yeah. So planning and closing, obviously related. Right. Look at this. We've like wrapped every all the themes together. That's right. They it's all almost... they all go go under the umbrella of the COVID closet. <laughs> uh, it's almost like this episode was like planned and organized. Shocking. All right. Weekly grind. Yes. You know what I did this week? What'd you do? I interviewed some masters or prospective master students, I should say. Because uh, we're, you know, it's uh, admissions season now, and uh, uh-huh. we're looking to admit people into our both our masters and our PhD programs, and uh, and uh, and so we go through a round of interviews. Obviously, they were all virtual. In the past, we had, you know, we would bring them here if you know if they were relatively nearby. Um, but uh, so so I interviewed a number of people, and uh, they were all great. <laughs> that's all I, one thing that's that was funny this round just a coincidence is that all of the people that i talked to were like familiar with baltimore um and so they had like no questions about it you know most huh. of the time I, I usually when i do these interviews everyone's oh what's it like in baltimore you know is it you know because they've never been there before um and so i often spend like half the time just talking about various aspects of baltimore but they'd all been here before they're like they're like we have no questions <laughs> makes your job easy yeah so what did i do um i guess i will say i'm putting these talks together and it takes a crazy amount of time to put a talk together from scratch, even if it's sort of in your general area, but like, you know, the angle of it is a little bit kind of different. So I spent the better part of my day yesterday doing that for one of my talks. Okay. I think that's it. Yes. So you can find us on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at the effort report. Um, you can also email us. Our email address is the effort report at gmail.com. Thanks everybody for listening. <laughs>